ask uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Fallon, you're now recognized. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Madam Chair. Director Ray, what law enforcement agency has primary authority and responsibility for the safety and security of the Capitol building and the, the Capitol complex? Congressman, my understanding is that that's the U.S. Capitol Police. U.S. Capitol Police. So it stands to reason that the singular most important person to have here today to attend this hearing would be the chief of the United States Capitol Police. And this begs the question, where is the acting police chief? Where is police chief Pittman? The reason, or better stated, the excuse that we were given is that acting police chief Pittman is busy watching someone else's testimony at someone else's committee hearing. The dirty little secret is she should be here and she could be here. In fact, we could have compelled her to be here via subpoena power, but inexplicably, our Democratic chairwoman refused to exercise her legal and entirely, in this case, entirely proper subpoena power. Now, I guess we'll see her on the 21st of July, but she should be here today as well. Director Ray, to date, of the 500 or so odd people, 500 plus people arrested for their actions on January 6th, have any, has anyone been charged with inciting an insurrection? I think I responded to an earlier question. Uh, I don't believe that that has been one of the charges used so far. But again, with that many cases, I want to okay, build but, in a little room for the fact that I might not know okay, all the cases. But so right, as of right now, the answer would be no, fair to say? That's my understanding. Okay. Has anybody been charged with sedition, to your knowledge? Uh, same answer. Okay, no again. Uh, has anybody been charged with treason? Uh, I, I don't believe so. Okay. Anyone, uh, in, has anyone been charged with illegal possession of a firearm inside the Capitol on that day? Uh, I believe there has been at least one instance of someone arrested with a firearm in the Capitol, uh, and there have been a number of arrests of individuals either uh, en route to the Capitol or near the Capitol for the, uh, for the but in, siege. Director, uh, but I don't, I don't have the exact number. Director, inside the Capitol, so there has, your, your testimony is there is one person that has been arrested for possession, illegal possession of a firearm inside the Capitol building that day. Is that correct? I, I don't know exactly what's in his, in, in his complaint or indictment, but I know there has been at least one person, or I've been told there's been at least one person arrested with a firearm in the Capitol on So January. you don't know, Director, if they've been charged or not with that crime. Is that correct? I, I just, with, with that many cases, I, I just okay. I can't be sure you're, about So you're not sure. Individual. Okay. Just reclaim my time. The, uh, the video that, we show, that was shown at the beginning of this hearing was visceral. It was unsightly. And uh, it does, it's emotional. And it's uh, outrageous what happened. The images and the actions that we saw in that video were disgusting and they were very disturbing. But uh, so we're, we're supposed to believe here that the best way to describe the, the events of January 6th should be calling it an insurrection. At least our friends across the aisle say that. But the, so we're to believe the strongest Republican history and the world's oldest functioning democracy was actually threatened to be overthrown by a mob not armed with any artillery or firearms or bayonets, but rather flagpoles, stolen podiums, and mace. So how can we, what's the best and most honest and accurate way to describe the events of January 6th? It is a mob that rioted. So we should be calling it the January 6th Capitol riot. Republicans have always condemned all political violence. So let's compare the BLM Antifa riots of 2020 with what happened on the January 6th Capitol riot. In the summer of 2020, there were riots that swept across 140 cities. On January 6th, it was in one building. In the summer of 2020, that, those riots cost $2 billion with a B in damages. On January 6th, a million and a half dollars. They were, months went by with these riots, and the riot on January 6th was about four hours. So there was more loss of life, more damage, and it lasted much longer and threatened scores of cities. We have had no hearings on the Antifa or BLM riots, but we have had now two hearings 
on the January 6th riot, and apparently we're going to have a third one in January. Director, one last question. Is it true that the FBI has not classified the Atlanta spa shootings as hate crime? Uh, I don't believe we've classified the Atlanta shootings uh, as anything. I think that's being uh, prosecuted uh, by local officials. Okay. And hey, Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, Director Ray, I'm asking you for, uh, uh, t for the record, a question for the record, and I'm requesting that you provide the following information to me and this committee and its members. Please provide us with all police records filed and arrests made for hate crimes committed against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in the years 2019 and 2020, and second, all hate crimes in general, and that would include police reports filed uh, alleged, alleging hate crimes, arrests made, and people charged with hate crimes, and lastly, hate crime convictions. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocate for the superiority of the white race. That is an absolute flat-out lie. It is not our greatest threat. Not once in his speech today did Merrick Garland mention last summer's BLM riots or skyrocketing crime on our streets, the riots we still see week in and week out. How about Merrick Garland? You condemn this man on your screen, Justin Tyran Roberts, arrested for shooting five people in a 20-hour shooting spree in Georgia over the weekend. You know why he did it, according to investigators? They insist he was intentionally targeting white, military-looking men. That sounds racially motivated to me. He didn't mention that. No mention of this black-on-white crime because it doesn't fit their divisive narrative. These are stories that are actually happening in America. How about we stop issuing fake warnings about crime based off of political agendas and start prosecuting all criminals, no matter what color they are? When you're up there, are you just getting tired of being told you're a racist, I'm a racist, everybody watching is a racist? Yeah. They have to talk about January 6th, and they have to talk about things that divide us on, uh, along racial grounds. It is, it is so wrong, but that's who the Democrats are today. They're this radical left-wing party, and they have nothing else positive to talk about, so they have to go here. Yeah. You know, you look at January 6th. Everybody has said it was a tragic day. It never should have yep. happened. They wanted people that were violent and destructive put away. But, you know, I was looking at Senator Ron Johnson. He looked at hours and hours and hours of tapes, and he was like something like 40 percent of the people were just let in by Capitol Police. But they don't talk about any of that. And you have SWAT teams showing up in California at somebody's house, trying to rouse them out of the house for walking around taking selfies inside that Capitol. It isn't right, Congressman. Or how about the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol? I mean, look, you're right. We Republicans have been, conservatives have been consistent. We condemned the violence that took place on January 6th, and we condemned all of it that took place all last summer with all these, uh, in all these metropolitan areas around our, around our great country. The Democrats are the ones who have been hip hypocrites on this. They did, they, last summer was fine. That was a righteous cause. But then they focused on, on January 6th. But the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol, the FBI kicks in their door, holds them at gunpoint, handcuffs them, interrogates them for four hours. They got the wrong couple. And then they take their phones, their laptop, and their pocket-sized copy of the Constitution. Talk about, I mean, that, that, there's got to be irony in that, that, that fact alone. So, yeah, that, where's the consistency that we would like from everyone? We've been consistent. I wish the Democrats would do the same. Yeah. Well, there's my pocket constitution. I carry it with me all over the place. And I'm in Texas, Congressman. Come and take it. Usually we're talking about guns. This time I'm talking about my constitution. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocate for the superiority of the white race. Garland did not provide any numbers or statistics to back up this claim, but pointed to past racially motivated shootings and attacks, as well as the January 6th riot on Capitol Hill. 
Noticeably, Garland spent his entire 26-minute speech without even mentioning the summer of riots one time, simply ignoring months of attacks on police and federal buildings in cities all across this country as if it just didn't happen. Steve, I think this shows how politicized Biden's DOJ has really become ignoring vi radical violent groups like Antifa, like BLM, simply because they support the left-wing agenda. Yeah, unfortunately, it's another example of two sets of rules or two sets of narratives, really, in a way. And the narrative being spread here, of course, is that January 6th is, uh, was a, a riot that somehow endangered the American Republic, which is not in any sense true. It was an unarmed riot, inexcusable for to be sure, but unarmed. No, not one person has been charged with having a firearm inside the Capitol that day, and it lasted a few hours. To try to compare that to weeks of rage and carnage up, across the summer last year in 2020 um, is just totally ludicrous and illogical. Unfortunately, that's right where Merrick Garland went. They're essentially pitting Americans against one another by by labeling it via basically a race war, which is essentially what they're implying with that statement. And I don't agree with it. And I think it's absolutely horrifying to see that you have the DOG, DOJ essentially being weaponized against the American people. There was, a, there was a rally in Chicago of white supremacists on January 25th. And they put out a national call and they got 80 people to show up in Chicago. And according to one expert, five people were from the Chicago area. Out of about, what, eight or nine million people who live in Chicago, there were five people. Right, and so a lot of this uh, the southern, the, relies on the Southern Poverty Law Center and the statistics that they put out and the media regurgitate that. And so I think we have to be careful. Certainly, I, I do not trust the media uh, on this issue because they, they have proven themselves to be uh, you know, not reliable when it comes to being partisan and pushing certain narratives. So um, is white supremacy, it, is there some in the United States? Absolutely. Is it the most, uh, biggest threat to, to America? I think that's overblown, and I think that the administration is pushing it for their own political reasons. You know, it seems to me that race relations in America in recent decades have improved so dramatically that things like, for example, interracial marriages are totally unremarkable in America today. Uh, and it is not considered acceptable in polite society at all to have racist views. And yet we have people like Garland and Joe Biden who want to insist that the country is systemically racist. Are they essentially protesting a struggle that has already been won in American culture? You know, there has been tremendous progress in this country. And, and for a lot of folks uh, on the left to, to, as they're saying now, this is you know voting rights, it's Jim Crow 2.0, that there's been no progress made since the 1960s or even the 1860s. I mean, that is, most Americans understand that's ludicrous. I mean, that is gaslighting, right? That is an absolute gaslighting right. of the American people. And so I think, uh, again, in our normal everyday lives, we do not see the bogeymen that are being made out. There are not Klansmen walking around the corner. There are not white supremacists uh, gathering on street corners. And so I think, uh, you know, that ultimately falls flat to the American people because that's not what we see and we live in our day-to-day -day lives. Right. And we understand that racism is really, uh, you know, has, has been a thing of the past. I mean, does it still exist today? Sure it does in certain areas. But is the, is the country systemically racist and oppressive? I don't think most people believe that.